Jorge, how are you today? You know what? I'm doing great. Yes. Uh, feeling very grateful. So I, I love the word. But you got me going when you said that this is the the most amazing show right now at 12 p.m. Eastern. So I, yeah. I, I've got, I've, yes. I've made, I'm here. I'm here. Yes. And, and Jorge, you're on the West Coast. Am I right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. We're in so, California, Watsonville, California. Yes. Nice. Nice. Southern California, right? I guess. No, it's same. actually it's, it's uh, the Central right. Coast, right by Monterey. Right. right yeah. Yep. I love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, I remember the, uh, I grew up with like skateboard culture, right? On okay. The East coast and, uh, yep. Santa Cruz, like Santa Cruz, uh, t-shirts and Santa Cruz logos. Like we're all over, all over that, the place. That is a love thing. It. That is yeah. a thing, you know? And then, um, I grew up in Southern Cal around that culture. So, cool. uh, Tony Alva, you know, yeah. all the guys from Dogtown, and, you know, oh yeah. So, wow. We can yeah. geek out on that. Yeah, let, let's um let's let's save it because I know that, that our <laughs> audience wants to hear uh hear this awesome dialogue. But before we really get into it, um, yep. I'm just loving some of these comments. Uh, so Devin is grateful for his family. Nice. Uh, always level set me after a stressful workday. I'm right with you, Devin. Uh, my family is 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 magical when it comes to that. They they can recognize it, and they step right in. Uh, I love it. Uh, we have Gloria joining as well from Miami, Florida. Hopefully it is uh, mm -hmm. beautiful and sunny down there. Uh, grateful for my health. Always something to be grateful for, of course. Maggie from Philly. Nice. Grateful for my dog and, and his unconditional love. Oh, my yes. gosh. I know. Yes. Was, uh, yes. Definitely a people's best friend. Uh, Ozma from Toronto, Canada. Welcome. Grateful for a healthy work environment. Always, always something to be uh, grateful for. And yeah, so this is amazing. So we have some, some great, uh, people in the chat. Jorge, yeah. is there anything that you're particularly grateful for these days? You know, what I'm learning to be grateful for is that every day that I'm waking up, I have the opportunity to be victorious. Right. Um, and it sounds very aspirational and, and I want it to be because I wake up every morning to literally live a grateful life. Um, to love generously and to inspire people to see that there is possible in the word impossible. And so, yes. you know, thank you for that question, because it's kind of like what I journal on um, and what I think about is how do I live, how do I love and how do I inspire? I love that. Uh, I love that response. It's funny. I just listened to I listened to Adam Grant's podcast. Yes. I'm sure you're familiar with Adam and his books and his works. Yep. Um, and and he just had a guest on and I apologize because I'm not going to remember his name, but he was a football coach and uh, he was talking about uh, he was not a fan of goals. Uh, and he liked mm. to set more abstract aspirations because he felt that goals can be limiting. Right. So if you want to break a four minute mile, you just have to run three minutes and 59 seconds, but that's not really unlocking your full potential. So when you <laughs> said to me just now, uh, you're grateful that every day you can wake up and be victorious. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like that victorious is kind of abstract. There's no limit mm -mm. to your victoriousness. You know, so like you can, you can sky's the limit, you know, you can define and redefine that every single day. So that's yeah, it, you know, in Simon Sinek, Tom has a book called the infinite game and yes. kind of like James Clear talks about setting um, uh, micro, uh, what do you call it, atomic habits, right? Yep. Well, I've learned through like listening to Simon Sinek and reading that book that when I say I'm going to accomplish this today, it's very finite. Sure. But when I say I want to be victorious, I can be victorious in the relationship I build with you. I can build, you know, have, be victorious in the environment I create with people that they create with me. How do I breathe positivity into their lives as opposed to, you know, pushing to negative? You know, it, it is amazing that abstraction, how much it helps. Yeah, I, I, I love it. And maybe something for our audience to think about, you know, as we get into the new year, people like to set New Year's resolutions, real tangible goals. Don't not do that. Those are valuable, right? right? There's value right. in that. But I love this idea of just waking up and being grateful for the opportunity to be victorious. I, I love that. Um, Congratulations to uh, Granite Construction turning 100 years old this year. That's pretty yes. amazing. Uh, yes. So you know it's it's pretty it's pretty great. I'm sure it feels pretty great to have joined a company with a legacy, uh, with history, uh, and, a, and a strong foundation. Mm. Um, why don't you share a little bit about kind of what your role is at, at, at Granite? So um, when I came over from Northwestern Mutual, I was charged to lift up. Uh, of the practice of diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
And so by doing that, um, I was doing the same things that I was doing for the last 25 years. But in this moment that I had here with Granite, it gave me the opportunity to take a look at, as I was doing the diagnostic that you need to do, um, what, what was important for us to, to actually practice. And we landed on practicing inclusive diversity. And the reason why that was so important, you know, if, if all of us can close our eyes and think about describe a construction worker, right? We're not going to be, maybe some of us are not going to see a woman. Maybe we're not going to see a person of color. And but yet we needed to be inclusive of that white male. And so in the conversation, we realized that what we needed to be was inclusive of all the diversity that we had at the company today at that time, what who we wanted to recruit and what did we aspire to bring. So that was my early charge as the VP of people and culture. You have talent acquisition and I also have workforce compliance. So it's a very um, I have a 360 view into the people that are coming in, the environment that we want to create in order to keep them, retain them and develop them sure. and also be a, a voice of the representation and how do we communicate it, how do we report it and how do we show the things that we're doing around this work. Yeah. I, and you know, we, we've talking to we've spoken to 100 guests, you know, on this on this show mm. um, and many of them are in HR. And one of the things we always like to joke is not it, it's very rare that someone you know age 9 10 11 mm -hmm. i really want to be in hr you know like that's their aspiration <laughs> yeah, they want to get yeah. into you know uh human resources um so it, how did you you know s stumble into this work you know was it was it a journey did you realize at a young age that this is what you wanted to do um or or did it just kind of uh come to fruition you know across across your journey so so I love the way you phrased the question, right? Because I think I will tell you and stumble into it. I had I was at a career conference because I thought I was going to be an attorney. I went I okay. uh, got a political science uh, um, degree with a minor in English literature. And so I was down that path. Um, and then I went to a career conference and a gentleman by the name of Jim Alanis just jumped right in front of me and said, hey, how would you like to come and work for Allstate in the human resources department? I kid you not. That's how it happened. And from that conference, you know, I went into HR, but then after a year and a half, I went into sales. So then I had 25 years of a journey, business journey throughout Allstate. Um, and then as I moved to um, craft, the diversity, equity, and inclusion team reported into HR. I went to Northwestern Mutual, it reported into a business unit. And then as I came here to Granite, um, I reported into HR and now I report into the CEO, but that's how it happened. Literally, you know, you're right. I, I don't think we, we see the world that way. And there's some amazing, I, I've learned over the 30 years, right, that there are amazing programs like Michigan State has an amazing human resources department, you know, sure. they teach. And so you could go to school to, and actually go do it. But I think most people go, come into it, you, you know, wanting to have purpose and serve others and they land in HR somehow. And yeah. uh, um, so that's how it happened to me. I, someone jumped in front of me. I love it. The, the, the path finds its way. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it really that's, is. That, that, that's awesome. Um, so this conversation that we're going to have, you know, it's really around diversity, inclusion and, and belonging. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to get your thoughts on how you define those, those core terms. And I think sure. I've had this challenge, you myself, you know, when we're communicating uh, and trying to have a real dialogue around diversity, equity, and, and inclusion and belonging, mm -hmm. I feel like the languaging sometimes gets in the way because I feel like a lot of people have different preconceived definitions and notions of, of what these individual individual words mean. And, and they might conflate two terms, you know, like, isn't diversity just inclusion? Isn't inclusion just diversity? And I think it can right. trip up, you know, even some of the, the smartest folks, you know, just because Correct. of of our own uh, languaging, you know? So how do you define and how do you think about these terms with your te your teams? So I will tell you that, every, it, it, I love the way you phrase it because I think there's different people that talk about diversity as the dance, right? Or they talk about diversity is a noun. They, they, you know, they like to label it to try to cognitively allow people to understand. And the way it hit me was through um, Andres Tapia, 
um, and he was at, at Hewitt and Associates at the time as the chief diversity officer. Now he's with Corn Ferry, and he coined a, a, a definition. Diversity is the mix, and inclusion is making that mix work. Awesome. So it's just plain stop, period, drop, mic drop, get away, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and, and when I heard that, I thought, you know, that is important because I've, you know, when I started in this work back in the mid 90s, it was just diversity. And then when we introduced inclusion, to your point, people are trying to figure out what does inclusion mean? Aren't we doing it through diversity, like you said? Sure. And then as we evolved, we started using the word equity and, and people have different definition for equity, right? Whether it's the representation, access, pay. Or is it the systems that you're trying to fix? And then now we're using belonging. Um, and Pat, um, oh, I'm, I'm losing her uh, name, but she was at LinkedIn at the time, coined dibs, right? The diversity, equity, inclusion, warders, Pat warders, yes. and belonging. And so I've grown, I've grown up in this practice knowing that if you practice good, diverse, and inclusive practices, if you do that well, then the outcome should be equity. The outcome should be an environment where people feel like they belong. But I think what has happened over time is as we talk to people, we find that there's a, a need of belonging and maybe it's a Maslow thing, right? Um, that you get into his thinking of needs um, that we say, okay, now we need belonging. Now we need inclusion. Now we need justice. If you think about after the death of, um, or I should say murder of George Floyd, prior to like that, there was only a few people talking about justice in the diversity, right. equity, and inclusion right. space. Now you have departments with that title in it. And so this is evolving, this is changing. So, but to answer your question, to go back to what you asked me, that's how I define it. That's how we define it here. We define it as diversity is the mix and inclusion is making that mix work. Now, my job is to then create greater clarity around what that mix is. Sure. And this is where what goes on outside of Granite versus what we're teaching at Granite sometimes collide. Because outside of Granite, people may hear it as only gender and ethnicity. Here at, inside of Granite, when we talk about inclusive diversity, we talk about all the diversity, all the diversity dimensions from your primary, secondary, and cultural dimensions are all considered to be part of that mix. And then how do we get to mi that mix to work is, is what we do with action, right? So that's how I would define it for you. I, I, I love that. And one thing that you said that I thought was really powerful is when, when you start to make that mix work, the outputs are, are these other thematic things that we hear about, you know? So Correct. It, it, inclusivity uh, and inclusion, it, it, it can be the seed, right? You plant that seed, you nurture it, it grows, and then diversity is 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 an outcome, right? Uh, belonging is an outcome. So I, mm -hmm. I think that it, it it definitely simplifies it for me, um, and I, I love how you broke it down. Now, now I'll just give you a little nuance in the way you yeah. you spoke about it. So if you're inclusive, you should have diversity, right? You sure. should have diversity. But we've realized when we, at least at Granite, when we called it diversity and inclusion, you have that ampersand in the middle. And just like, you know, I don't know if you have kids, but I have two in a happy meal. My son only ate the hamburger, didn't eat the French fries. Sure. Right. So in this case, he would do the diversity and not think about the inclusion. My daughter liked the French fries because of salt. Right. So she would eat all his French fries and she would give him the hamburger. So she would do all the inclusion and not do the diversity. We're being really mindful here that. In or, you need to know what you're trying to be inclusive for sure. because you could create an environment and not have the diversity you need, both of thought and of culture and of experience. So that's the only nuance I would add because you have to be really mature. You have to be really um, intentional with impact on getting diversity through your inclusion practice, through your inclusivity, sure. yep. right? Yep. Okay. No, I appreciate that. And I, I think it, it leads in nicely to kind of my, my next question. And I'll preface this by acknowledging my own gender bias here. Mm, right? so, okay. So whenever I call a, a plumber or an electrician, I, I inherently, I have a bias that a male will show up at my door. You know, like I, I've just, I've grown up 
with with that bias, right? And and uh, I don't think I'd be uh, shocked or surprised if 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 a female or a woman, you know, showed up at my door. But I just have this bias that that's who's going to show up. And I I think the same bias applies for me for construction. You know, like mm. I have I have uncles, cousins who are in construction. They have their own businesses. Um, and my perception of a construction site, most construction sites that I've been on, is that it's mostly male. Now I know you know you had mentions uh, diversity for granted goes well beyond gender uh, and mm -hmm. ethnicity, um, but I am very curious though. You know I think it's incredible to see Granite invest so much in inclusive diversity, but how do you determine the mix? How do you set goals that are realistic? How do you think about what that mix should be? Um, knowing kind of the the reality of different geographic locations, you know, just knowing the reality of um, how people end up in that trade or end up in that in that area. Uh, like if someone told me, if I was in your position and someone told me mm. we need to get 60% women and 40% men on our work sites, like how would you respond to that? You know, like, like is, is that how you approach goal setting? Because I've seen a lot of companies try to take the numbers approach uh, and not take into consideration geography and not take into consideration different things that are realities. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, I, I, thank you for that. And, and I appreciate you framing it. I, I would tell you, um, I was landing at Denver airport and we had some turbulence and the pilot landed that plane like if it was a feather and just like, bam. Yeah. And out of yeah. my mouth, out of my mouth came out the words my man did a great job and i was clapping yes we get sure. i'm walking down the aisle and the person that was saying thank you for flying with us was a woman yes and it was one of those moments that i'm thinking here i am vp of inclusive diversity and still out of my mouth comes these things right and 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 i tell you that we're if you have a brain you're biased let's just put it that way um and and, and so to, to, to address your question, I would tell you, I'm real mindful of well, the problem that we're actually trying to solve. And so in construction as an industry, we have a workforce um, development problem that we're trying to solve. We're trying to get more people, we're trying to find talent pools that um, can feed the talent that is no longer coming to us. Because over time, people have said, in order to be successful, you have to get a college degree. Sure. So folks that were really good with their hands were shepherded into going to college. And now they're finding out we're, we have people with degrees that are craft workers. So even in your question, the way you phrased it, there are amazing opportunities. And I didn't learn this until I got in the construction industry, right? Um, in the back office, controllers, CFOs, you know, managers, you know, um, SVPs, leaders, the industry is so diverse that you have vertical uh, construction companies the, 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 that specialize in architecture. You, our company is heavy civil engineering. And over time, you see the mix of graduates changing when we go and recruit. So now you almost have a, a really solid 50-50 mix of engineers. In the past, it was 80-20 men, right? So sure. you have to take a look at where are you trying to grow? Because there's an art and science to it. Um, the market availability in Utah is different, um, or in Provo, Utah, is different than Los Angeles, than sure. Chicago, than Miami, than in Dallas, Texas, okay, or Virginia even. Um, so to say to someone in Everett, Washington, you have to have X percentage of Black people because the population of the U.S. is 16 percent, and Everett only has. Two percent. That's I, that's part of your question, right? Part of my question, yeah. Yes, it's, yeah. It's, and, and then the other thing is, and this is you know, and this you see it happening, right? So companies say, oh, we're going to recruit at HBCUs, and we're going to go recruit at these places to bring people to Everett, Washington. I'm trying to be dramatic here, right? Sure. And yeah. Then you realize that on the ground, the cities, the municipalities don't have the infrastructure to support the culture. Yes. may not have the you know the hairdressers may not have the products that are necessary to support a community and then all of a sudden the very people that you brought in now are leaving so you ask a very um, 
complex question, but not complicated. So as a company, what you want to do is you want to see where you can make the greatest impact on the short term, but with the long term strategy, because the sustainability is the key, because you can't create the churning, you know, from an HR perspective, because the talent acquisition costs are so crazy. Sure. Like you don't want to overinvest if all you're doing is having people walk out the back door for the activities that you're doing on the front door. And that is a rep recipe for uh, a lot of failure because now the very people that are trying to buy into what you're doing, now they're you're feeding their mind and saying, this is not going to work. So you have to be very impactful in your actions. Yeah. Very holistic. Um, yes. It, 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 it seems. And uh, it's interesting. It, it, it almost makes me feel like you have to be mindful of, of belonging. I'll use that word belonging, mm -hmm. not just in the context of work. Right? Correct. Mm -hmm. The community, right? Yes. Where, where you'll live, you know, uh, who you'll engage with. Um, yes. And, and, and really making that work for your employee. And again, that I think that requires that holistic approach of thinking about your people mm -hmm. as, as people, right? Not just as Correct. workers who will clock in and clock out. Uh, so I appreciate your answer there. Um, I, mm -hmm. I think you understood what I was asking um, yeah. in, in the um, interesting way that I framed it. Uh, <laughs> and it ties in a little bit with my next question. Um, I was you know, poking around on the Granite site and, and I think mm -hmm. you have an amazing uh, core values page. Uh, and mm -hmm. I've, you know, we have um, here at Phenom, we have a career site product, right? So I've seen a lot mm -hmm. of career sites uh, mm -hmm. and I've seen a lot of career sites with core values pages with uh, stock photos and words that you know sound good, but you're not quite sure if they're authentic and, and you're not quite sure if they, they live that and they feel that, right? Uh, it's almost like you could take those core values and put them on anybody's site. Mm -hmm. uh, but for Granites, I really felt a lot of intentionality with your core values and mm. I felt the authenticity and uh, also kind of the, the creativeness, right? So I liked that. Uh, inclusion, you know, was, was there as well. But one core value stood out to me and that was safety for all. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought when I was reading that, I, I thought that really makes sense for a construction company, right? Because you want to promote safety on the construction site. But in your position and in your line of work, Jorge, because this is where my mind went. Sure. I'm curious if you think about that beyond just the work site, you know, does this is safety for all something that uh, it, it does push into inclusion and belonging for you? So it does. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, and, and and I don't want to get too esoteric, right, in, in my, my answer, but I think you'll appreciate where I'm going with it. So if you take a look at the work that was done at Google around Oxi the Oxi Project Oxygen relating to psychological safety, yep. and, and when you ask that question, my brain goes to you know to answer it that way that it does it extends beyond the physical safety that's needed but in order for us to have that physical safety there has to be a level of trust collaboration understanding that if you and i are on the work site tom i got your back you got my back and if we see something that's not like um not right the ability to speak up so that someone can listen you know, um, the reason why safety became such a big thing and in our five core values, and I'm going to lean over here because it's, we have a quote by Pop Wilkinson that says, as our company, this is what we say, we say, boldly contending for which is right and firmly rejecting which is wrong. So we get the, the inculcation that takes place, right? The, in, the intentional reminder that that's what we're here to do and safety um, is something that we practice. And so when you saw that with those core values, yes, it leans from the physical safety outside of the work site to anywhere at Granite or anywhere even with the community, okay? So we have to be inclusive. You know, if someone in the community says, hey, you know, this construction site is putting a lot of dust in, in at my house or on my yard, is there anything you can do the interaction safety, and that's why I wanted to, the pivot from psychological to interaction safety, it has to be one that now the community speaks up and I've created the environment, Granite's created the environment where we're listening. So our job is to mitigate that request. 
Um, and, and so, yes, um, we need to have the ability to be able to speak up to saying, hey, we can't cut corners here. I, I would rather stay 30 minutes more or an hour more making sure that the work site is clean as opposed to having this dust kick up. And then we have the community telling us something. So um, very intuitive that you picked up on that. But yes, it's very intentional. And I would tell you that the intentionality and the impact that we wanted to have with those five core values was that you can't have one literally without the other. Sure. You can't have sustainability without creating an inclusive environment. You can't have a level of integrity if you don't have the interaction safety or the psychological safety. You can't have the inclusion if you don't have the integrity to actually practice inclusive diversity. Sure. So they're all connected. And so yeah. very intentional in the way we designed those. Yeah, I, I felt that, you know, the symbiotic nature you know, yes. of, of all of them working together. Um, really fantastic. And again, you know, my 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 kudos as someone who looks at a lot of these types of pages, you know, mm -hmm. like for, for mm -hmm. really designing that in such a way yep. that that gives a lot of purpose, you know, to the core values and, and to your mm -hmm. your team. Yep. Um, you, we kind of touched on this a little bit, you know, but when we're practicing inclusive diversity, mm. how much of it is kind of like that art of unlearning, right? And, mm. and really being able to step back and uh, paying attention to how you think such that you can retrain how you think, you know, or, or rethink how you think. Um, and, and how do you help encourage that uh, if, if, if you agree? So, so you did read that book by Adam Grant, right? Oh, I'm an Adam Grant fanboy. Yes, I see. <laughs> yes, that. yeah. So, so I will tell you that, you know, it's it's I, I, it's funny because I think back back a long time ago, someone told me that things like people react in four different ways, and I don't know this to be true today, but l l let me just go along with me here: is that people either either indifferent, sarcastic. No, it's indifferent, cynic, cynics, sarcastic, or enrolled. And the reason why your question is so important, I think, is because everything about inclusive diversity is about helping people unlearn what they've learned, relearn, and then help them feel comfortable that they, that they should right. always unlearn to relearn to learn. Um, because it's always evolving. It's always, this work is always evolving. You think about the conversations that we're engaged with now. I mentioned justice. How about the use of pronouns, right? I identify as he, him, his. There are some people that feel some kind of way about using pronouns. But then there are some people that by me identifying myself and sharing my pronouns, I've created an opportunity for someone to feel like they're part of this conversation that we're having today. Right. And so but that takes unlearning. Right. If someone yeah. is non-binary and they want to their, they, they, their pronouns are they and them, it is to some people that have grown up learning the English language. To some, it's difficult using the pro pronoun they in sentences to describe an individual when cognitively they see a man. And how do they say they when they, it's a he or how is he doing? And they say how are they doing. Right. So. I share that with you because there's a lot of it and we have to acknowledge that we have to build that dexterity or agility to do that. And we have to feel comfortable to go into every interaction. And that's probably the hardest part there, Tom, is, is that it's in every interaction that you may have to unlearn something that you had learned and relearn something so that you come back to it again the next time. While your brain, while your brain, right, if you, if you yep. get into geek out on on the psychology or even the neuroscience behind it, your brain is stopping you from doing it. It's saying, Tom, yep. don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it, Tom, don't do it, right? And it's our job to push through that and unlearn. Yeah, yeah. It, like when, when I go into a grocery store, mm -hmm. I always take the same path Yes. instinctively. You know, like I go mm -hmm. into a grocery store and it, it's guiding me one way. They, they, yes. you know, they want you to go one way. And I think you have to intentionally have your brain, you know, um, halt, course correct, you know, and 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 try to take different paths. Um, and and uh, can I, if I can just add to what you just said, because it was brilliant. So now you know why we call it inclusive diversity also. It would have been very easy 
to come in and say, no, we're the diversity, equity, and inclusion department. Sure. But the pushback and the um, the blowback to what was to what was happening externally, I needed to change that. And and one of the things, one of the guideposts that I said to myself, the minute people start saying we are granted practice inclusive diversity, I knew that we've made the pivot. And yes. sometimes you need to create, you need to create that. Sometimes that gets into the atomic habits by James Clear, right? You you need to create that first step to change. And sometimes we we go at it trying to do it all at one time. And this is, you know, like I've been I've been asked, Jorge, well, I've been told, Jorge, you're going too fast. Slow down. Yeah. Or I've had people say, Jorge, you're not going fast enough. And I what I tell them is I say, listen, this is not about going fast or slow. This is about how far we're going to go with this. Yep. Right. So yeah. I don't I don't get distracted by the fast and slow. I want to make sure we go far. But then there's guideposts that that tell me that we're getting there. Yes. Yes. Um, goes back to the very beginning of our of our conversation, waking up and being victorious. You know, correct. There, there is no limit. You know, mm -mm. And, and, this is infinite. This is an infinite game. An this infinite is an game. infinite game. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it is definitely playing that infinite game. And, you know, when we had our uh, we had a pre-call, uh, yeah. Jorge and I back in September, um, and I just remember being so energized by that call. So I appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. No worries. It yeah. really made my afternoon, um, you know, just kind of getting me excited for this conversation. And, and uh, uh, the excitement has carried over. Um, but we talked a lot about intentionality. Um, and I think that this is this is it right it, it is it is needing to walk into environments into into interactions um and being intentional about you know stopping you know not going the way that your brain typically goes mm -hmm. stepping back and and kind of being intentional about this unlearning and rethinking um do you have any frameworks or tips you know to help your brain because you mentioned earlier anybody with a brain has bias you know and, right. and I, I agree with that right and uh how can we start to tra train our, our our brain do you have any thoughts or, or pointers you know for anyone who struggles with this yeah so um i do um and the two that really resonate for me as, as you asked that question and i was trying to figure out okay which one do i give them here um there's two the first one is I always put myself in the environment, whether I'm receiving it or if I'm giving it to someone, right? Is, is it I'm creating awareness or am I receiving awareness? Am I being asked or am I asking someone to participate? Or does it need me to be engaged or do I want people to be engaged? And it almost has become kind of like a continuum for me of when we talk about the things that we're doing here at Granite, whether it's our internal podcast, our external podcast, our 192.2 Granite radio that, that we're gonna be doing this afternoon, is it, are we doing it for awareness? Are we doing it to get participation or are we doing it to get engagement? Yes. Because ultimately it, that will dictate the effort, the approach and the, the bar that we're trying to set. Because if we're trying to create awareness and we're expecting engagement, we shouldn't be disappointed if the awareness was received. Now, if we're getting engagement and all we, we want engagement and we spent a lot of effort and all we got was awareness, then we got to figure out what, what didn't we do. Okay. Sure. So that's the first one. The other one, it's a more tangible that we try to teach people both as leaders or individual contributors. Can you notice the difference? Can you understand how someone feels or how they want to be treated? And then finally, how do you act? So can you notice, can you understand, and how do you act? Because you use the word intentionality and someone, you know, th th there's a lot of work around empathy and you probably heard it, we need to be more empathetic. And I think up to a certain point, they're right. But if you study the Dalai Lama, if you study, you know, Eastern, you know, type of religions, the, the, the word that really resonates for me is compassion, right? It's like you have pity, sympathy, empathy, and then a higher level is compassion. Can you notice someone and can you be there with purpose to help? That's the definition of compassion. It's not just no, feeling for them and being there in their shoes kind of thing, 
but it's can you help them? And in this work around inclusive diversity, our actions have to have impact. They just can't be intentional where they just lie in your heart and in your mind. Because by definition, intent is a very passive word, right? Intent is you're intending to do something. Well, it's the action that actually makes all this work come to fruition. And so um, I think those two frameworks, right? Awareness, participation, engagement, and then how, can you notice, can you understand? Sorry, Jorge, I lost you for one second, but you're back sure. now. So we're okay, all great. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. we're good. Okay. Internet okay. stuttered, but I heard you. I heard you clear. That, that <laughs> I didn't, is super I didn't, helpful. I didn't no, freeze. No, okay. no, no, you're good. You're good. All right. you, you are in you are in full motion right now. Um, I, I love that. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, and I, I think that that you know awareness is that first step. You know, like like just just being able to really start to take that first step, I think is is super helpful. Uh, as we begin to wrap up this this conversation. Uh, Jorge, I wanted to to bring up something just because I was I'm I'm deeply curious about this, and I just felt like you'd be a great person to kind of have this quick quick dialogue with. Mm. Um, you had brought up the murder of George Floyd earlier in this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's no surprise talking to me, especially with this light shining on my face. Yeah, I, I'm a white male, right? Yeah, I am extra white today due to the lighting. Um, and, and I grew up, I grew up in, in a predominantly white suburb of Philadelphia, right? And I remember, uh, you know, going through that as a nation um, and, and going through that as an individual. And I remember uh, I, I read How to Be an Anti-Racist uh, mm. right after that. I read White Fragility. Like I, I wanted to consume content and consume ideas so that I can be a part of that conversation mm -hmm. uh, and, and really uh, understand how I can contribute to that conversation, being who I am, where I'm from, et cetera. And mm -hmm. I felt like at that point, I've never had more productive conversations and hard mm -hmm. conversations and also uh, hard, internal conversations, right, than, than I did then, right, in, in, in 2020. And I felt like in, in the HR space, uh, it really electrified those conversations uh, in, mm. in HR for the next, you know, 12 to 16 months. But I feel like those conversations are not happening anymore, right? Mm. That's my, that, that's me as an individual saying that. Um, and I, I'm just curious if, if you think that we've pulled back on having hard conversations, right? And maybe recession and economic turmoil has taken the front seat of the national, you know, conversations. Because what I'm afraid of is it's going to take another tragedy to light up conversations again, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm curious how you feel uh, about, you know, inclusion and diversity. Are, are we really having the hard conversations today? Um, and then, you know, my follow up question to that is, is whether you agree or disagree, how do we continue, right? If we're not having them, how do we start, right? And, and keep that alive. And if we are having them, how do we continue and make sure that they're fruitful, right? Because I, I, I hate to see uh, this topic feel like a headline trend, you know, that fluctuates. Mm. It needs to be yeah. present every day, right? Correct. So, man, like you said, as we're starting to wrap up, right? It's almost seems yeah, like right. we're opening up, we're, open, we're opening up a conversation. Yeah, yeah. So I will tell you that. So thank you, right? Thank. You. Let me acknowledge, and thank you for the actions you took after that murder. Okay. Um, let me say to you, you representing white males, and I, I don't, I don't like doing that, but just because you you brought sure. it up yeah, that way, sure. right? Right. Um, I would tell you that. People of color, right? Those, those tragic, those tragedies have been happening in our history all along. And all along, um, how do I say it? There's been those peaks of conversation, debate, um, and then it wanes, and then something else happens, right? And it just continuously, there's something that we have. 
and, and I don't know if it's in our culture, so I, I just don't want to define it as here as a US centric yeah. type of thing. But I will tell you, the me, the model that really resonates is, and I talked about it from a neuroscience perspective, our brains, our brain wants to keep us in that comfort zone. And the reason why it's easy not to continue the discussions is because we get dopamine for for staying in that comfort zone that the minute we go into that fear zone it's uncomfortable it you know like, like we're not growing to have the discussions so it's the companies that continue to do this with the cadence not letting the attention wane are the companies that five years from now and we say this at granite five years from now a woman's going to be like, I gotta, I gotta go work at Granite. That is the most inclusive place for a, in in construction for women. That's where I want to go. That's how com that's how companies are going to be defined in the future, I believe. Sure. Um, by the environments that we create, the environments that we sustain, the so that instead of having these episodic things dictate how we should act, then that we're ready for it. Right. We have um, a community hour in the first week of December here at Granite. So quarterly already our community calls are already scheduled for next week. I mean, next year. Sorry, 2023. And, and, and it's like we're we're, we're going to be bringing these topics up. We will talk about the election and the impacts. We will talk about role versus weight. And in our in our podcast, and you had mentioned it earlier on our pre-call construction DEI talks, we felt with Stephanie Roldan and Teosha, Baker Bunch, and along with Abby Combs, that we needed to keep this conversation out there, right? Especially in our industry, because we're not as mature as some other companies. So you ask a, a question because in that question, there's a curiosity thing that if your comfort zone is not to be curious, then it will take episodic things to happen, sure. right? But if you are, then the next level is how do you discern how do you take the information that is being like is being delivered to you and say, wait a minute, let me go fact check this. I did this just yesterday with Dave Chappelle's monologue in SNL. Um, we had some people tell me it was anti-Semitic and, and, and I'm listening to it. I'm thinking, you know what? Wow. I can see both sides. And that's the other side of it. I can see the Jewish community saying, Dave, you can't do this. You said everything that Kanye said, or Ye said, and you made fun of it, but you represented it in a funny way and you kind of normalized it. I can see that. I can see a comedian saying, hey, I'm gonna have us laugh about this thing, right? And then I can see people saying, hey, he was just being funny. But it, it's, it's, we'll never learn how to see both sides so that we can appreciate the solution in the middle if only we see one side of the discussion. And so this is why um, it's important to read, it's important to discern, it's important to have this conversation because there are people here that technically in their comfort zone don't need to worry about it, right? Yep. Yep. And, and I tell you that I have that conversation with my son in high school about how ladies staying out, how he needs to drive when a police officer stops him, what he needs to do. There were people on the soccer team that never had that conversation with their kids. And here I am privileged to live in a neighborhood in Chicago, in the suburbs of Chicago, that I shouldn't be worrying about that. Sure. But I was. So very complex, right, um, question that's different than the, the questions you asked previously. So I hope I'm making sense there, but, but um, thank you for asking the question. You're definitely making sense. And again, like we could plan a whole other episode right, to go deeper into, into this. Yes, um, yes. But I, it, I just felt like, uh, conversations like this, you know, uh, mm -hmm. real dialogues, you know, asking hard questions. Um, I, I think we, we all need to engage more. Right. And, and I, I think it's helpful to get your perspective on it. Uh, so I appreciate we need, nor we, we need to normalize that. Sure. We need to normalize, but our society, like we don't like getting into tough conversations. Yeah. Right. And, there's and we fear. try to, there's fear. yeah, fear. there's fear. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why that, you know, Comfort zone, learning, sphere zone, learning zone, growth zone, right? Yep, love it, yeah. 
So we're coming up on the hour, uh, Jorge. So I want to thank you so much uh, for, for joining us, for bringing your expertise, your experience, um, and, and your thoughts uh, with us. Do you have any final thoughts or any words of wisdom uh, for any HR professionals who are joining us today? You know, for HR professionals, I would say this. One of the things I've learned and take great pride in it is that we are the vanguards of the policies and procedures of the company. But inherently, people look to us as being also not only the culture keepers, but the culture makers. And so um, we got to wear that. We got to wear that hat also that we, you know, so if inclusive diversity, equity, inclusion are part of your department, continue to embrace them and, you know, put that out there. And if they're not partner with them, sure, um, because yep. they will help. Yeah, really appreciate it. Um, we have. Uh, one thing. So construction DEI talks. Yes. Apple Podcasts, Spotify. I'm sure people can find Stitcher, it. Stitcher. You can find Stitcher. it. Um, all, you can go on that. LinkedIn, follow me. We'll, you'll see the, um, the, um, the podcast. We got a great episode, Tom. Yeah. Season two, we're getting spicy as they nice. say. I, yes. I, I love it. So everyone out there listening, uh, check out Jorge on LinkedIn, uh, connect with him, let him know that you found him through, through the show. Uh, and you're not just some random LinkedIn spammer. We all get that <laughs> from time to time, right? So make sure you leave him a, a comment. Let him know who you yeah. are, and where you found him. Um, check out the podcast. Uh, we'll, we'll drop a link in the show notes when we create a blog post for this episode. So you can uh, link to that super easily. And uh, check out Granite's website. As I mentioned earlier, check it out. Check out the site. It is a great uh, opportunity to see uh, an awesome culture page, uh, an awesome uh, core values page. I uh, definitely want everyone to check that out because if you're thinking about maybe restructuring your page, uh, definitely some exciting tips that you can take from that. So Jorge, again, I appreciate it. Thank you for joining appreciate me. Uh, yep. And uh, we will uh, hopefully talk after this for a little bit and uh, I will catch up with you soon. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Well, once again, that was Jorge uh, Cazada. Super awesome conversation. Really appreciate it. Uh, and not an easy conversation to have, right? And, and I think sometimes that's important. And we, we touched on that. Uh, we touched on inclusivity and, and diversity, and and I love the idea of uh, diversity is 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 the right mix, uh, and, and inclusion is making that work, right? Uh, I thought that simplification, uh, when we try to really get in there and add definitions for all these different things, and and it gets difficult for us to even have conversations when we're all thinking about things in different ways. Uh, so Jorge really broke down a lot. Uh, if you tuned in midway or tuned in late, you'll always be able to go back and uh, check out the replay. So I really hope you have an opportunity to do that. Uh, once again, this was Talent Experience Live. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we have an awesome event next Tuesday. So it's going to be uh, on the 22nd of November. Uh, if you're listening to this way in the future, you'll still be able to Google it, find it, watch it on demand. Uh, that's going to be all about our Talent Marketplace product here at Phenom. It's called Experience Phenom Talent Marketplace. It's going to be about 90 minutes. We're going to showcase uh, our employee experience product uh, and suite of products uh, and how we're helping employees uh, stay engaged, develop their skills, evolve over time. And our goal is that that will boost retention at your organization uh, and create that inclusive and, and uh, belonging that we so deeply want to build for our organizations. So thanks again for joining. I really appreciate your time and your attention. This has been an amazing conversation. Tune in uh, next week. Next week will be Thanksgiving. So we will not be here on Thanksgiving. I wish everyone a fantastic holiday if you're in the United States. Uh, and we will be back the following week with a conversation with uh, Ashley Blackmore from Newell Brands, uh, who is doing amazing work uh, with talent mobility and helping her internal employees uh, discover future opportunities. So thanks again. My name is Tom Tate. Uh, I will catch up with you all on a future episode. Take care.